let's begin by reviewing what we know about the free electron model. Our free electron model was built upon the idea that we've got some volume that we define in a box L by L by L. When we solved this, we found eigenfunctions indexed by the wave vector like this. So we've got uh, plane waves and we found an eigenvalue wave vector uh, was quantized based on the size of the box. So right over here. We're in integers. Because <clears throat> we know that energy and momentum share eigen uh, functions, we also then know that the momentum operator Acting on our eigenfunction returns this as our eigenvalue. And in a semi classical approximation, that tells us that momentum is h bar k, so that's a vector, is equal to mv. So we make the semi-classical approximation that we can directly equate the uh, mass and velocity to the measurable value. And once we have all of this, we talk about the occupation of these states. So these define the states, and then once we have the states, then we know the number of electrons in the box, and those will then occupy those states. And our occupation of states is defined by the Fermi-Dirac distribution where mu is our Fermi energy. R Fermi, which is the uh, dividing energy between the occupied and the empty states. And in this, uh, the Fermi energy can be related to a Fermi uh, k value through, let me uh, just put it over here, by substituting in to this equation. Now, we represent all of these solutions graphically by moving over into a reciprocal space representation in which we can plot kx, Ky 
Z. And remember, the order that you put these in isn't important as long as you maintain a right-handed uh, coordinate system. And we represented these <clears throat> as individual points in that space. Remember, of course, that our K is quantized. Uh, each particular point in this space is a particular solution. And of course, each of those states can take two electrons because uh, we have the uh, spin uh, degree of freedom as well. Based on knowing that we have occupation uh, of lower states preferentially, and knowing the Pauli exclusion principle, we can then define a sphere in this space where that is the Fermi uh, wave vector, and inside the states are full, and outside they are empty. <clears throat> and of course, as we increase the temperature, that means that we have states here that were full, that will become empty, And basically, you get a, a, a broadening of, of this uh, interface, or a kind of a blurring of that interface, according to the Fermi-Dirac distribution. We can uh, reformulate our Fermi energy in terms of the electron density, because we know the number of electrons in our box. This rho is equal to the number of electrons in the box divided by the volume of the box. And that also allows us to redefine our K Fermi like this. And using our semi-classical approximation that h bar m is equal to m v, <clears throat> sorry, h bar k, sorry, our semi-classical approximation for the momentum, that allows us to express v Fermi h bar over m 3 pi rho one third. And this uh, is a way of talking about uh, the velocity of the electrons that are sitting uh, at the Fermi level. And we know it's the electrons at the Fermi level that are actually engaged in giving us the physical properties that we're interested in. Now we can take all of this knowledge uh, and determine the densities of states. <clears throat> which is, again, the number of states available uh, at a particular energy level. Because we're talking about a spherical shape, we know that as we change uh, k's, changing energies, uh, we change that density. And that is going to go as the energy, uh, the square root of energy. <clears throat>
which means that we're going to wind up with a density of states that looks like like this. And the density of states at the Fermi level is equal to uh, The density of states at the Fermi level is equal to 3 halves n divided by e Fermi. And uh, we can take this uh, Fermi energy and we can also express it in terms of uh, temperature, talking about. Oops, E Fermi is equal to the Boltzmann constant times T Fermi. So we're just talking about thermal excitations uh, at the Fermi energy, which gives us that T Fermi is equal to E Fermi divided by K. So this Fermi temperature is in the order of 10 to the 4 Kelvin. So it's, it's very hot. And in fact, as you approach this temperature, that's the point where we have a sufficient number of electrons excited that our Fermi-Dirac distribution starts to begin to look, to look a lot like the Boltzmann distribution. Because we have gotten some of those inner electrons ex excited uh, sufficiently high that, that it uh, is no longer looking just as though you have the thin outer shell uh, interacting, but the entire electron population becomes active. <clears throat> but of course, to reach this point, you're, you're, uh, you're talking about temperatures that are uh, on the order of uh, the surface of the sun. Uh, within this density of states, we talk about uh, exciting electrons uh, according to the Fermi-Dirac distribution. You're going to wind up with a occupation that looks something like this. So we have some empty states over here, and we have some full states over here. Some hashing in there. And this allows us to uh, approximate the heat capacity And it turns out, after you do all the math, the heat capacity is equal to the classical heat capacity for a classical gas multiplied by T divided by T Fermi. This classical heat capacity is 3 halves times the Boltzmann constant. This T divided by Tf, the actual temperature divided by the Fermi temperature, is essentially giving you the fraction of electrons that are participating in the heat capacity. So this T divided by Tf is, is a handy uh, is a handy approximation to carry around with you uh, when you're thinking about metals that will obey a, a free electron gas type behavior. Now talking about this heat capacity, we can represent the heat capacity experimentally uh, as obeying the empirical expression 
cube. So if we take and we plot c over t versus t squared, we'll get something that looks like a straight line. And the intersection is gamma. This gamma point turns out, uh, from experiment, does not match that of the free electron model. And the way that we correct for that is we start introducing concepts such as quasi-particles, in which we say the electron's mass is no longer just the mass of the electron, but it's the mass of the electron and its interaction with the surrounding electrons and uh, crystal. In, in this case, well, I suppose in a real system, it's, it's all of those interactions. So we would say that the thermal effective mass thermal effective mass divided by the mass of the electron goes as the observed uh, gamma divided by the gamma of the free electron gas. And this is, is a way for us to make kind of a first order correction to our uh, free electron gas model to better fit experiment. And just in terms of observed relationships, what comes out of this is that we see now that our Fermi energy goes as 1 over the uh, mass. We see the heat capacity goes as 1 over the Fermi temperature. 1 over the Fermi energy and the mass of the electron, which kind of makes sense if you think about the uh, energy for heat capacity being stored in the kinetic energy of the electrons. And then this gamma also going as the mass. So this is a review of what we know already about the free electron model. Let's continue this free electron model and look at how within a semi-classical framework we can connect this to the electrical conductivity of metals. So if we treat a metal, <clears throat> we treat a metal as though it's an uh, electron moving as, as a free electron gas. We can talk about the force on these electrons due to electrical and magnetic fields. So the force is the mass times the acceleration, or the derivative of velocity with respect to uh, time, and again, these are vector quantities. And then substituting in for mv, uh, we have the momentum. So we have h bar d k d t is equal to negative q e plus v cross b. So in this expression, uh, this capital E now is going to be the electric field. Uh, and in my notes, with respect to energy, I'm going to try to start using epsilons for energies. Uh, but we're not going to use that so much here. We're much more interested in the kinetics. So this is the electric field. This is the velocity of the electron. This is the applied magnetic field. And Q is the charge on an electron. And I like using Q to mean the value of the charge, but not necessarily the sign. So that negative is going to give us uh, uh, the fact that we have a, a, a negatively charged particle.
So let's begin by looking when the magnetic field is turned off. So we only have to think about the uh, electric field. So in this case, we have h bar d k d t is equal to negative q e. And we can integrate this, taking the t over the other side, and we get the integral from k at t equals 0 to k at t equals t. dk is equal to the integral from t equals 0 to t equals t, negative q e over h bar dt. Now, our q, e, and h bar are all independent of time, so those come out, and we wind up with k, t, minus k at 0 is equal to negative q, e, over bar t. And bringing this over to this side, we can say uh, So what's happening there? What's happening there is that essentially we have, if we look in the kz direction, uh, <clears throat> this is a ky, we'll have some circular or spherical taking into account the disease coming out of the page, uh, distribution of our k points. So this is our k Fermi. And then over time, this is going to drift. And that drift is given by that expression. So it's in the direction opposite of the applied electric field. And the degree of drift is delta k. That is delta k. <clears throat> and you think to yourself, well, how far does it drift? Uh, and remember, of course, this k is tied to our velocity, right? Because our uh, semi-classical approximation for the momentum. And you think, okay, so how far is it drift? Well, according to this equation, it just keeps going and going. But we, we know that's not the case. And, and the reason is that we get scattering of these electrons. If there was no scattering, then these electrons would just continue to uh, shift and the velocity would continue to increase indefinitely. So scattering a cap on this. And this is scattering. That is going to be what limits delta k because after some point, they scatter back, and we just get some uh, constant offset uh, for a particular applied electric field. So our delta k is limited by scattering, which means that we can write qe over h bar tau, and that is 
tau is going to be the mean time between scattering events. So if we can control tau through impurities or uh, electron density or temperature and phonons, that allows us to control delta k, which allows us to control the degree of offset during an applied electric field. <clears throat> so let's relate this delta k to uh, electronic properties. Okay, so going back to our, our semi-classical expression, h bar k equals m v, we have v is equal to h bar over m k. Okay, so when we had the sphere centered in our k space, then at t equals zero, the expectation value of k was zero. And when we turn on the electric field, in equilibrium with e not equal to zero, the expectation value of k is going to be equal to r delta k, right? So we're just talking about the degree to which our sphere was offset. And this is going to allow us to define the drift velocity of our electrons. Our drift velocity is going to be coming from the expectation value of k. This allows us to write h bar over m delta k, which gives us negative q e over m tau. So we can relate the drift velocity to the applied electric field, the mass, and the uh, time between scattering events. And if we group these terms, this is going to be mu sub e. So this is going to be equal to minus mu e e. Again, vector quantity. This mu is our electron mobility. So if you think about it, uh, the drift velocity, that's just the velocity of the electrons. The E is an externally applied field. So everything that we know, sorry, I didn't group this right. I should uh, group this a little bit differently. There, <laughs> that's our, our uh, electron mobility. Uh, this electron mobility is where we have all of the materials information, because that tells us about the scattering. So we've got the velocity, and now we can relate the velocity to current. Show that. <clears throat> so the uh, current density which we're going to define as J, Q, N, V. So this has, has uh, 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 units of charge per area per time. And that's because this is charge per particle, particle per length cubed, length per time, and that gives you then a uh, charge per area per time. Substituting in to this the drift velocity, 
we can say that the current density is n q tau over m e or n q mu e. But we also know that Ohm's law tells us a relationship between the current density and the applied electric field. That tells us that the current density is equal to the electrical conductivity times the electric field, which means that this n q mu is our electrical conductivity. And yes, this should be a second rank tensor, and no, we're not going to talk about that, uh, but just for the sake of talking about magnitudes and uh, uh, direct relationships, we can talk about this being our conductivity. And just to remind you also, our resistivity is 1 over the conductivity. So that means that the conductivity is n, is n q squared tau over m or n q mu. And just as a matter of giving you some order of magnitude for this tau, this tau uh, is going to be related to the distance between scattering events. So we know the distance between scattering events, that's going to be the Fermi velocity times tau, remembering that it's only the electrons at the Fermi level that are contributing to the conductivity. So if you have a way of measuring L, for example, knowing the density of defects or the uh, density of phonons, uh, that's a way to get an approximation for tau. What do we know about the experimental observations of resistivity in metals? Well, we know that at low temperatures, the scattering is dominated by lattice defects. And we know that as we increase temperature to room temperature and above, as we increase T, we start seeing scattering from phonons. Or, or lattice vibrations. Now, these two processes are independent of each other. We have scattering from point defects. At the same time, we have scattering from phonons. And as we increase the temperature, basically, we're just turning on an effect. And that means that we can add together the rates of these two processes. <clears throat> and because the processes we're talking about one over time, tau is going to be our uh, one over tau is going to be our rates. So the total rate goes as one over tau uh, let's call this uh, In my notes, I'm calling it sub L. Uh, let's call this C for collision. T plus 1 over tau I. So these are impurities 
I have no idea why I chose an L in my notes. Uh, let's call this a P for phonons. Tau P for phonons. So electron phonon scatter. And because uh, the conductivity uh, goes as the resistivity inverse, and the conductivity goes as tau, that means that this relationship allows us to express the resistivity as an additive sum and basically we can add up all of the different contributions to the resistivity and adding these together and we can have other effects as well uh, we're not talking about those right now but in the future, if you ever encounter those, uh, just remember that if you can separate out the scattering uh, events and make them independent of each other, as we did here, then it allows you to add the resistivities. And, and this is called Matista syndrome. And the thesis and rule tells us that our resistivities in metals will look something like this. <clears throat> so this, at low temperature, is going to be dominated by impurities, and up here we see phonons becoming activated. So this region here at phonon impurities at, at uh, t equals zero. And that is basically that point right there. This is sometimes called the uh, residual resistivity and when people uh, characterize the degree to which phonon scattering becomes activated as a function of temperature they talk about the residual resistivity ratio or the R R R and that is the conductivity at T equals 300 K divided by the resistivity at zero. So the higher the resist residual resistivity ratio, the purer the material. And, and by that, I mean that this number, the resistivity at zero, gets smaller and smaller. That also tells us that well, we know from observation as well, that as you change the purity of a material, both in terms of a, a composition and in terms of uh, intrinsic defects, such as vacancies, uh, dislocations, grain boundaries, we see this curve shift downward. which is basically telling us that this uh, residual resistivity drops and the phonons are not being affected by this. They will be affected by impurities, but it's less so than the resistivity of uh, the resistivity of uh, 
uh, free electron gas moving in the metal. Now let's consider what happens when we turn on the magnetic field. So to turn on the magnetic field, we go back to our force. And we see that the uh, force is proportional to the velocity of the particle across the magnetic field. So let's draw system x, y, z. So let me draw <coughs> some hypothetical conductor like that so okay we've got a conductor and let's say that we've got current flow in the x direction. And if you have current flow, that means you have electrons that are flowing the opposite direction. Thank you, Benjamin Franklin. We uh, have electrons traveling that way with a velocity. Now we'll turn on a magnetic field in the z direction when that magnetic field passes through our conductor and our electrons are going this way our electrons are going to have a curve to them that make them turn that direction so to just take and draw this as a as a projection Y, Z, and I'll draw my conductor still in orange. The electrons are going that way. My current, oh, sorry, that's X direction. X, that's the X direction to the right. Uh, the electrons curve that way, and what that does is it results in the buildup of charge here and here. And when you get a charge uh, separation, that means that we have an electric field, EH, and that's, uh, we're giving it a subscript H because uh, this is called the Hall effect, so that's the uh, Hall electric field. So this Hall effect, right over here, EH uh, is the induced electric field and is equal to B cross J. So it's the magnetic field crossed into the, so the magnetic field, color scheme the same, is coming out of the page here. So the, the Hall electric field is proportional to the magnetic field crossed into the, uh, flux, and we have this RH as a constant of proportionality, and this is called the Hall coefficient.
because we, we know that it's proportional to be in cross J, but we don't know the, the magnitude. Okay. So, after this system has run, you know, basically you turn it on, you have some transient effects, and we reach a steady state relatively quickly, but we, we do reach a steady state condition. And in steady state, what's happening is that we have electrons that are curving due to uh, the uh, force on the electrons, but then we have a second effect in which we have electrons that are being accelerated due to this Hall field. And if we have a uh, steady state distribution of charge, that means that those two forces have to be equal. So the, the force due to the, the B field is going to be the velocity in the x direction dot b q, and the force due to the uh, Hall field is going to be uh, equal to the Hall field times the charge, which means I can equate those two in steady state, and the velocity in the x direction dotted into b is equal to the Hall field. So we know that relationship, and we also know that this velocity is going to be related to the charge density, the flux. which means our Hall field is equal to B negative JX over NQ. And if we want to, we can, well, we do want to, we can regroup those. NQ BJX. Okay, so we've got that, and that tells us that this, which is uh, relating the uh, Hall field and the uh, uh, magnetic field and the flux, going to be Hall coefficient. So our Hall coefficient is equal to minus 1 over nq. And remembering that the electrical conductivity is equal to nq mu, that gives us something that we can substitute in and we get that the mobility is equal to R H sigma. And the real problem that we're going to come up to is, is that this Hall coefficient is uh, it's variable, and not only is it variable, but sometimes it can change signs. And changing signs means that uh, we're basically seeing either a change in the number of carriers, which we're really not, or we're seeing a change in the sign of the conductor. So in some metals, we're not talking about the flow of negative charge, but we're talking about the flow of holes. So some of our metals, uh, which can actually be, you know, not bad conductors, we're talking about the flow of the absence of electrons rather than the flow of uh, electrons themselves. I'd like to talk about uh, another anomaly that we observe 
But uh, to do that, I need to introduce the thermal conductivity in metals. And in metals, the thermal conductivity is, again, carried by the free electrons that are at the Fermi level. If we're talking about the uh, flux of a quantity, and in particular you think about gas treatment and you think about flux, so if, if gases are flowing, free electron gases, uh, we can talk about the flux of a property And the flux is going to be the flux in the z direction, and it's going to be proportional to the velocity. A gradient of some property, and uh, the gas mean free path, and uh, uh, one third. So this is a uh, uh, from uh, classical gases. So for example, if we were talking about p being the particle density or the, the concentration. And that would let us say that one third L B bar D, and we would get J is equal to negative D B C D X. We get fixed first law. And we have a relationship for the uh, diffusivity. But in our case, here, talking about thermal conductivity. What we're interested in is we're interested in the uh, energy. And we're talking about the flow of, of thermal energy. So if P is the energy density, then heat flux is one third V bar L DE, sorry, total derivative DE by DZ. And we can take our, <clears throat> excuse me, have my pens here. And we can take and relate this to uh, thermal gradients. So we just uh, multiplied and divided by uh, dt. This is heat capacity, and that is our thermal gradient. So we wind up with one third v bar L C dt by dz, and this. is K, our thermal conductivity. And it's, again, it's the constant of proportionality between the heat flux and the uh, thermal gradient. Note, again, the heat flux is an external uh, observation, the thermal gradient is external, so the thermal conductivity is where all of our material properties are, are being encapsulated. Okay, so let's let, right, change colors here, if we say, let V bar equals V Fermi, and let L equals V Fermi tau, we can put those in uh, here. So that'll give us, that will give us uh, um, K is equal to 
one third the Fermi squared tau C. Substituting in our definition of the thermal uh, of the heat capacity. And again, in metals, the primary uh, mechanism of, of heat capacity is the uh, free electrons. Pardon me here, this is a kind of a multi-step substitution. Well, let me just drive it straight. Tau pi squared over two N K. T over T F. Okay, uh, this little K that is our uh, Boltzmann constant. So we've got that. <clears throat> uh, substituting in that E F is equal to one half M V squared. The F squared, so the F squared is equal to uh, two E F over M into here gives us one third E F over M so two over three. EF over M tau pi squared over two N K T over T F. Okay. Uh, this two and that one half cancel. Substituting in EF is equal to KBF. Right, the definition of the Fermi uh, temperature into here. We get one third KTF over M tau pi squared n k t over t f which is going to cancel that t f and that t f and I'm also going to use the fact that we have n is the total number of electrons, but we're interested in the number of active electrons. So we're going to use that uh, n, the number of electrons that are actively involved in thermal conductivity, those near the surface, uh, the Fermi surface, is equal to capital N T over T F. So N T over T F. So actually let's leave this T F here. Leave that one there. Which allows me to take N T over T F out and have one third or one over three M K squared. Tf tau 
pi squared n. Right. Use k. So we're able to talk about the thermal conductivity in terms of uh, being inversely proportional to the mass, which makes sense. Uh, the Fermi temperature times k squared. So that's going to be the, the the Fermi energy. We're talking about the. Uh, uh, the energy of the electrons uh, that are active is proportional to the uh, time between scattering events and the number of electrons that are actively involved in thermal conductivity. So that uh, has a lot of a physically intuitive meaning. So now let's talk about comparing the uh, thermal and the electrical conductivities. And, and this is called the, the wiedemann franz law. The wiedemann franz law was an empirical observation. I'll, I'll take this out, I guess. Well, no, I'll, leave, I'll leave that. The wiedemann franz law was an observation that if you take the thermal conductivity of a metal divided by the electrical conductivity and divide that by the temperature, uh, within a uh, free electron model, you get pi squared over 3 k over q squared is equal to 2.45 times 10 to the minus 8 watt ohm per k. This is L, which is the Lorenz number. And it is believed that this was constant. Uh, it turns out it is not really constant. Uh, and there's several different plots. I, I took a figure in my notes uh, out of uh, the Ashcroft and Merman uh, textbook. No, actually, sorry, this is out of Hook and Hall's textbook. And it turns out it's not really constant with temperature. It, it varies slightly. And the reason that it varies is because even though our thermal conductivity has this physical property, and, and our electrical conductivity is n q squared tau over m. In both of these, you know, n is the same, pi is constant, uh, t Fermi is constant, q is constant, m is the same, uh, the charge is the same, it's not in the thermal conductivity, but this term, tau, scattering is different. And is different because the definition of scattering is different. So if we think about uh, electrical conductivity, and we think about uh, being in our steady state conductivity, we're basically talking about having a sphere which is offset by some distance. And when there's a scattering event, the electrons that are sitting on this leading edge are going to have to scatter. And they're going to scatter back to these states. And that's the definition of scatter in uh, electrical conductivity. In the case of thermal conductivity, what we have is we basically have uh, a device in which we say, let's say we have the hot side 
and a cold side. And on one side, we have proportionally a much higher number of electrons that have been excited. Remember, what's causing thermal conductivity is the fact that we have more electrons available on the hot side to conduct uh, and scatter by, you know, random walk uh, toward the cold side. I mean, our thermal conductivity is, is a lot like uh, diffusion in as much as we're talking about a gradient in heat carriers. And diffusion is, is a gradient in, in uh, particles. And in this case, when we increase uh, the temperature and we get more scattering, this is what the scattering does. We get scattering, but the scattering is just within that region of the Fermi surface. Whereas thermal conductivity, the scattering has to go all the way across the uh, sphere. So fundamentally, the reason that the Lorenz number is not, well, the Lorenz number is constant, but the reason that the Wiedemann Franz law uh, is not exactly true is because the nature of the nature of scattering in thermal conductivity is not equal to the nature of scattering, sorry, in electrical conductivity is not equal to the nature of scattering in thermal conductivity. And we can only explain this through the use of uh, a quantum-based model that tells us that our uh, scattering has to do with these wave vectors. The wave vectors can be represented in k-space, and their scattering events uh, operate fundamentally different.